As you watch this teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire, strengthen, and equip you with vital insights and understanding from the Word of God. Here is Rick. Welcome to today's program. My name is Rick Renner. I've been waiting for you and friend. Today we're going to return to the wonderful power-packed epistle of Jude. And as I've been telling you, Jude wrote his epistle because someone passed to him the second letter of Peter. And when he read what Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 2 about scoffers and false teachers and false prophets and teachers emerging in the church at the end of the age. It really, really disturbed Jude. Then he got to chapter 3, and he saw that Peter wrote that in the end of the age, scoffers would appear in the church. Well, Jude was so impacted by what he read that he scrapped his plans to write an epistle about salvation and decided that instead he would also deal with these issues and build on top of what he had read in Peter's epistle. And that's what the book of Jude is. And actually, if you read the entire epistle of Jude, then you read 2 Peter chapter 2 and chapter 3, you will see how similar they are. They were really studying each other's material, building on top of each other's material. And of course, the Holy Spirit was adding more and more and more revelation along the way. But I'm offering you the series, which is called Mockers in the Last Days. And this is what we're going to be dealing with today. The Holy Spirit prophesied at the very end of the age, there would be mockers who would arise in the church who would scoff and mock about the coming of Jesus. Wow, it is amazing how accurate the scriptures are. And this comes with a study guide. And we're also offering you right now my book. Oh, I want you to have this book. It's called Last Day's Survival Guide, a scriptural handbook to prepare you for these perilous times. It is an exposition of 2 Timothy chapter 3. And my friends, when you read those prophetic verses as they are expounded on in this verse, you will feel like it was the newspaper telling us what is happening today, but written 2,000 years ago. It is so accurate as the Holy Spirit well described what would happen in the world at the very end of the age, and He didn't give us this information to scare us, but to prepare us. If we know what's going to come, then we'll be prepared for it, and that's why I call the book Last Day's Survival Guide. It's got somebody's boots, their Bible on the cover. That's because we've got to grab our boots and our Bible. We're going to stomp through this age in victory. But hey, I want you to reach for your Bible. And let's go back to the book of Jude. And today we're going to begin reviewing in verse 17. But before we begin, remember that if you need prayer, you can call us at any moment during the program, any time during the day. We're waiting for our phone to ring. Write our number down and keep it there so that when you need somebody to pray with, you can always pick up the phone and call us. We really want to pray with you. Or maybe you just want to send us an email. The moment your email shows up, we're going to get into agreement with you. Jesus said in Matthew 18, 19, if two of you, that just takes two of us, me and you, if two of you will get into agreement about anything, my Father will do it. We'll get into agreement and we'll ask God to move and He really will do it. But hey, reach for your Bible again and go to Jude. And today we're going to begin with the RIV of verse 17. And of course, the RIV is the Renner interpretive version, which is a conceptual interpretation of the New Testament. But listen to this, the RIV of Jude verse 17. But beloved, I call you that because it's the only word I know to express how deeply I love and cherish you. It's actually a translation of the Greek word agapetoi, which we covered in yesterday's program. It's a plural version of the word agape, which is the word for the love of God. This word is so difficult to translate. I say that on a human level, the easiest way to understand the word agape is to describe what a parent feels when that parent sees his newborn child. When you see that child, it brings such awe out of your heart. I remember the first time that I saw Paul, who was our firstborn. I cried when I saw him. It was such a miracle to me. 
Yet at that moment, he didn't know who I was. He couldn't say, hello, daddy. He had nothing to give me. But when I saw him and saw what a miracle he was, it caused such awe and wonder and admiration to come out of my heart. Everything in me was compelled to love him. And if you've had a child, you know exactly what I'm describing. That best describes the word agape. It's the wonder, the respect, the awe, the admiration you feel for something that you've seen. It causes love to come out of your heart for that object. That is the word agapetoi, which is translated beloved. And it tells us what kind of love we should have for each other in the church. When we see each other, we should look upon each other with wonder, remembering who we used to be and who we are now, the amazing work of grace that God has done in our life, how God has transformed us, made us as new creatures. When we look on each other, it should cause awe and wonder to come out of our heart and make us really want to love one another, cherish one another. And that's why I translate the word agapatoi like this, my beloved. I call you that because it's the only word I know to express how deeply I love and cherish you. Always remember, never forget, and continually call to remembrance the words which were spoken earlier and prophetically by the apostles and personal representatives of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we saw in yesterday's program that the word words in verse 17 is a translation of the Greek word rhema, which describes spoken words, not necessarily written down. And it tells us, because it's plural, that the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ were continually saying and saying and speaking a lot of things about the end of the age. And the verse even says, never forget, continually call to remembrance the words which were spoken earlier and prophetically, the Greek word prolego. Pro means earlier or before or in advance. The word lego means, I say, compounded together, it really gives us two ideas. Earlier on, they were speaking about this and they were foretelling or they were speaking prophetically about things that were going to occur at the end of the age. And he's referring to words which were spoken by the apostles and personal representatives of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we come to the King James Version of Jude, verse 18, which says, How that, speaking of the apostles, how that they told you, and by the way, the word told in Greek, elegon, means they were telling and telling, saying and saying, which means the apostles were speaking a lot about end time events. Sometimes believers say, oh, why are these Christians so taken with end time events? Well, according to this word elegon, which here is translated told you in the King James Version, it means the apostles themselves were talking about this all the time. They were saying and saying, telling and telling how that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own ungodly lusts. But notice he begins with two words in the King James Version, how that. And it's actually a very good translation of the word hoti. The word hoti points to something very specific, very important. How that. He's trying to grab our attention. Here is what they were saying. How that they told you. And the word told you again, the word elegon. The tense means they were telling and telling, saying and saying. They really wanted you to understand that there should be, should be as futuristic. Here Jude is pointing to the end of the age in the future, the period of time that we live in today. He says there should be in the future, futuristically, mockers. And the word mockers, the Greek word impiktes, from the Greek word Impaizo. Now, what in the world does that word impaizo mean? Well, I'm going to tell you. Listen to what it means. It was often used for playing a game with children or amusing a crowd by impersonating someone in a silly and exaggerated way. It could be used to describe a game of charades. When someone intends to comically portray someone or even to make fun of, to ridicule, or to mock someone else, and again, to impersonate someone in a silly and exaggerated way. And one of the best examples we have of this word impaizo in the entire New Testament is when Jesus was brought before Herod Antipas just before he was crucified. 
And the Bible says that Herod Antipas wanted Jesus to perform a miracle for him, and Jesus refused to perform a miracle on demand for Herod Antipas. And when Jesus refused, it says that Herod's bodyguards began to mock Jesus, the same word, impaizo, that is used here. What does that mean? It means they carried on terribly in front of Jesus. They began to mock him, acting like they were healing people's eyes, acting like they were raising the dead. Ah, is this how you do it? Mocking him, ridiculing him, making fun of him, carrying on like a game of charades at Jesus' expense. And now Jude uses this word to say in the end times there will be mockers. And what will these mockers be mocking? Well, you're going to find out in just a moment because we're going to go to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, where Peter also addresses this subject. But we're talking about people who ridicule, make fun of, poke fun of, in an exaggerated way, do everything they can to humiliate someone else. And Jude says they will arise in the church in the last time. The word last is the Greek word eschatos, which means the ultimate end of a thing. So the Holy Spirit here is pointing to the very, very end of the age. It is the extreme end. And in classical Greek literature, this word eschatos was used to depict the place furthest, furthest away, like the ends of the earth. And it was used in a nautical sense to describe the last port or the last stopping off point on a journey. If you've come to this port, there's not another port to go to. Therefore, it is something that is final. So now the Holy Spirit is pointing to the very, very, very end of time. That's the word that is used in this verse. And the word time that is used here is a form of the Greek word chronos, which describes a particular season or a specific time. And here the Holy Spirit says, when time has run out, when time has sailed to its last port, you've come to the final very end of the age. Mockers are going to arise, mocking, who will walk after the flesh. And the word walk is the same word, pereomai, which Jude has used over and over and over and over in this short epistle. The word pereomai means to leave where you once were and transfer into a new place, to leave a good place and go to a bad place, which means these mockers did not begin as mockers. But in some way, over a period of time, they've left what they have once believed, and now they've become so cynical that they're mocking others. Who are they mocking? We're going to find out in just a moment. But he says they walk after the flesh, the word after the Greek word kata, which means corresponding to ungodly lusts. And the word ungodly is, again, the Greek word asebes, from the word sebes which normally describes that which is reverent, pious, respectful, or God-fearing. But when you attach an A to the front, it cancels or reverses the word. So what was holy has become unholy. What was reverent has become irreverent. Those who once had a fear of God have lost their fear of God. It depicts those whose actions are unholy, unsacred, impure, and whose activities are unsanctioned by God, their behavior demonstrates they possess no reverence or fear of God or for that which is holy. That is amazing. And actually, the RIV of verse 18 would be like this. How that they, speaking of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, how that they were constantly saying that in the very end of days, when time has sailed to its last port and no more time remains for the journey, in that season, there will be mockers, scoffers, and false teachers who will ridicule and make fun of those who believe it is the last times. I'm talking about individuals who have left the path they once walked on and have now gone in a new direction. Contrary to the life they once lived, now they're bent on following after their own irreverent cravings and desires that are disapproved of and unsanctioned by God. That is a pretty good translation of Jude, verse 18. But now let's go to 2 Peter chapter 3. So if you have your Bible, go to 2 Peter chapter 3. We're going to begin to verse 3, and you're going to see how similar are these texts. 
And remember, Jude said, the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ told you that in the end of the age, mockers would show up. Well, now he's going, we're going to see what Peter had to say, who was one of the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ. So in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3, Peter writes, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Do you see how similar that is to what Jude wrote? But when Peter writes, knowing this first, the Greek uses the word proton. It's very important. It describes something that is first, something that is very, very important. You must know this as a matter of first priority. First, you must know this. And the word know is a form of Greek, which means know it, know it, know it, know it. The Holy Spirit is trying to alert us to what's going to happen at the end of the age. He says that there shall come in the last days scoffers. The word that is again the Greek word hoti, which points to a specific and very important point. It's like the Holy Spirit is saying, red alert, he's sounding the alarm. This is what I want you to get, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. And it's so interesting to me that the words there shall come is a form of the Greek word erkomai, which describes a futuristic coming, but it also depicts a loosing, a future loosing. It's like something's going to be loosed negatively inside the church. And what is it? There shall come in the last days scoffers. The word last is again the very same word that Jude used, the Greek word eschatos, which points to the very ultimate end of a thing here, the very, very, very end of the age. You could call it the last of the last days. It is the extreme end of a thing. And again, it was used in a nautical sense to picture the furthest place away like the ends of the earth or the final port or last stopping place for a ship. If you've come to this port, you cannot sail any further, hence something that is final. So Peter says, when you've come to the end of the age, when there are no more ports to stop at, nowhere else to go, you're at the very, very end. And then he adds the last days. In Greek, it says the last of days, the last of days. We're talking about the wrap up of the age. And Peter says at that moment, scoffers will appear and they will be loosed. They will be loosed. Well, the word scoffers, again, is a form of the Greek word impaizo. But what's really interesting is the Greek uses this word twice in this verse, one right after the other. And a literal translation is scoffing scoffers. They will habitually be scoffing. They are scoffing scoffers. And because it is a form of the Greek word impaizo, which was used for playing a game with children or amusing a crowd by impersonating somebody in a silly and exaggerated way, or to depict a game of charades when someone intends to comically portray someone else or even to make fun of, to ridicule, or to mock someone, it tells us they're going to mock the rest of us who say it is the end of the age. They're going to make fun of us and they'll do it regularly. And that is why this word impaizo, a form of it, is used twice, one right after the other. There will come scoffers scoffing, scoffing, walking after their own lusts. Then in verse 4, Peter tells us what these scoffers are going to say and say. The word saying is the Greek word legantes, a better translation would be alleging, alleging. Alleging where? is the promise of his coming. The word where is, inter is interrogative. It means they're going to ask us almost in a sarcastical way, come on, give me a break. Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. And then he adds in verse four, saying where is the promise of his coming? The word coming is the Greek word parousia, the same word that Jude uses to describe the coming of Jesus, a technical word used to depict the royal visit of a king or an emperor or the arrival of one who alone had the authority and power to right wrongs and to set things in order. And the use of this word parousia to describe the advent of Christ tells us when Jesus comes as king and emperor, he will come with the authority and the power to wrong, right every wrong in the world and set everything in order. That's what's going to happen when Jesus comes. And then when you come to 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, 
Peter then adds, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. Be not ignorant. Literally means don't let this be concealed from your sight. Keep this truth in front of you. Keep this truth in front of you. What is the truth? That one day with the Lord is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. You see the scoffers scoffing are going to say, come on, give me a break. If Jesus is going to come, he would have come by now and they're going to mock us, ridicule us and make fun of us. So Peter says, hey, 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 guys, don't let this truth be concealed from you. Keep it in front of you. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And then he says in verse nine, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but as long suffering to us word praise the Lord, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The word slack is the Greek word braduno, which means to be tardy, to be slow, to be delayed or late in time. It means Jesus is not tardy. Jesus is not slow. He is not delayed. He is not late. He says he is not slack, he is not late, he is not tardy concerning his promise that he's going to come again, as some men count slackness, but he's long-suffering. Why is he long-suffering? Why is he waiting and waiting and waiting? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The word perish, the Greek word apolumi, the word apolumi means to be destroyed. God loves every soul. God does not want person to be destroyed. He's waiting for that last person to repent. And that leads us to the word repentance in this verse, which is the Greek word metanoia. The word meta carries the idea of a change. The word noia is from the word nous, which is the Greek word for the mind. You compound the two words together. It forms the word metanoia, which here is translated repentance. It describes a change of mind that results in a complete radical change of behavior, a decision to completely change or entirely turn around in the way that one is thinking, believing, or living, a decision to change one's thinking and believing, a total transformation affecting every part of of a person's life, both inside and outside, resulting in a behavioral change. We're talking about repentance that transforms a person's life. Jesus has not come yet because he's waiting for that last person to repent. That's what he's waiting for. So we should be thankful that he hasn't come yet. And by the way, if you want to know more, about repentance, I've written a little book that I'll give you today only. And the book is called Repentance, What It Is, What It Isn't, and How to Do It. But both Jude and Peter said, one of the ways you'll know you've sailed to the last port and you're at the very, very end of the age is there will be scoffers who will be released, loosed in the church, who will constantly be scoffing and making fun of the rest of us who believe the coming of the Lord is near. My friends, Jesus really is coming soon. Hey, my announcer is going to tell you how you can order all of the teaching materials we're offering to you today, and then I'm going to pray for you. The Bible says one of the signs we've come to the end of the ages, there will be mockers who mock and make fun of the rest of us who believe Jesus is coming soon for his church. In fact, the Holy Spirit said these mockers will appear right before the closure of the church age. What exactly does the Bible tell us about this? And why is it taking so long for Jesus to return? In the series, Mockers in the Last Days, Rick Renner opens the scriptures to show us what the apostles prophesied over and over about events in the last days. In this five-part series, Rick covers Enoch's prophecy about the last days, murmurers and complainers in the last days, mockers in the last days, and the good news that Jesus is coming soon. This five-part series is available in digital or physical format starting at just $10. We are also offering you Rick's book, Last Day's Survival Guide. It's a must read for you to know what the Bible tells us about the end of the age and how to navigate the times we are living in right now. The world around us is being shaken and seems to be falling apart, but your foundation can be so strong and secure that you will be unshaken and can live victoriously through this end time season. Last Day Survival Guide can be yours for only $25. Don't miss this special offer, the powerful series, Mockers in the Last Days. 
in the book, Last Day Survival Guide. Call the number on your screen now or go to renner.org to order. Call or go online now. Thank you so much for being with me today. When we come back tomorrow, we're going to pick up where we left off in the book of Jude. Are you enjoying the book of Jude verse by verse, word by word, and looking at the RIV of all of these verses? Well, I want you to get the whole series. And the whole series this week is called Mockers in the Last Days. What does the Holy Spirit say about mockers being loosed in the church in the end of the age? He's very clear about it, and you need to understand it. So order the series, and it comes with a study guide. And we're also offering you right now my book, which is called Last Days Survival Guide. And my friends, we're not just to survive. That's why I put boots and the Bible on the cover. We're to grab our boots and our Bible. We're going to stomp through this season in the victory and power of the Holy Spirit. The subtitle says, A Scriptural Handbook to Prepare You for These Perilous Times. Please order yours today. And hey, when you reach out to us online or by giving us a call, let us know how to pray for you. And right now in Jesus' name, I speak the power of God to you and I declare Jesus really is coming soon. He is. Hey, until tomorrow, remember Ecclesiastes 8.4. Where the word of a king is, there's power. If you enjoyed that teaching, please subscribe, like, and comment so more people can see it.